Do not be deceived. That confident talking stethoscope wearing man with an interesting lean requires more than a second glance. Dr. Emmanuel Hossein, a father of four, has influenced the lives of many. So why his lean or sometimes interesting posture? That is attributed to his battle with polio. In 1958, a very young Emmanuel Hossein was diagnosed with possibly the most severe case of polio at the time. I was paralyzed completely for six months. I uh, was in a coma for two weeks. I was in the iron lung. That's a respirator. Um, for another two weeks, uh, I then spent a year in the Princess Elizabeth home for handicapped children and um, had a number of operations to be able to walk, to use my arms and, and legs and what have you. Um, stayed there for a year and uh, then I came home, went back to school, um, did common entrance. The very first year it was introduced, uh, came in the top ten in the island. Uh, went to St. Mary's, um, and then that was it. These are challenges some of us can't begin to imagine having to face. From a tender age, Hosein had to be strong and determined to get through everyday life. There were key people nudging him on. My father was the sort of person who felt, listen, whatever the doctors say to do, you have to do. So all the operations that I had, you know, um, he was the kind of person who said, go and have them done. So I had, you know, five different operations, you know, so that I could use my arm, I could use my leg, uh, etc. Uh, and he was somebody that, you know, we all knew we could rely on 100% in life. My mother was the kind of person who said, you make sure and get your education. You know, I came home from the Princess Elizabeth home, uh, you know, on a Wednesday. And the first thing she said to me is, anyway, you go to school Monday, eh? With a sometimes stern tone and manner of speaking, Dr. Hosein must have taken after his parents in this regard. He was not always liked by everyone. I was his good friend. Anything he said was fine with me. Um, but there were people who thought he came across, especially in those days as a medical student, uh, somewhat arrogant. And um, he has that tone of voice when he's giving an opinion, as if you, if you ever spoke to him, you would realize. But you know, I, I didn't think anything of it, but some people thought he was a little bit arrogant and opinionated, I would have to say. So some of his schoolmates perceived him to be a bit overconfident, but his Jamaican-born wife recalls he really wasn't an ordinary young man. He's one of the few guys I knew at that time who made sure he had to hear the BBC News every morning and read Time magazine and Newsweek. People, guys at that age did not read those things and at that time the BBC was a scratchy news and he would be fiddling with the radio station to make sure he gets it. And that's what I admired him most, his intelligence. So if Emmanuel sounded like he felt he knew more than you did, it was possibly because he did. Again, similar to his parents, behind the firm voice was a caring heart. And I've admired him throughout his years of his passion towards helping the poor, towards fixing things. He was one who got very upset when things didn't work right. And from early in our marriage, when he was working in Port of Spain General, he used to come home so frustrated at times when things didn't go right in the hospital. And these are some of the things that push him into politics. And uh, these are some of the things that I admire, his tenacity and his, you know, his effort to go after making things right. You know, a lot of times people might not appreciate the things that you have done or the way you have done things, but his heart is always in the right place. His work as a medical doctor explains the stethoscope, but in the prime of his medical career, Dr. Hossein undertook another grand career path. He made a brave move into political activity. He's certainly a braver person than I am. 
because in those days putting forward a political opinion or representing a party was not necessarily viewed as a natural ambition, something that one, um, you know, a part of a career, unless you were very politically inclined. And he, as a medical practitioner, was able to do that. He was able to withstand criticism. His ability to remain focused in the face of criticism was nothing new to this gentleman, who had proven his debating skills from as early as secondary school. Dr. Hosein came to love politics. My mind always ran on issues of uh, uh, national concern. So I think it's the way my mind works more than anything else. I was concerned about, uh, you know, why some people didn't have, uh, you know, and this is why I started my career, political career, with the United Labour Front. You know, I suppose if you're young and you're not a socialist, you don't really care about people. You know, when you get older and you know more how the world works, if you're not a little more conservative, it's because you're not very bright. You know, so I think my politics started, you know, with that socialist thinking. Uh, our our uh, slogan at the time was, let those who labor hold the reins, uh, you know. Um, but it's, it's the kind of background that I came from in Tunapuna and the way my mind works, I would say, is why I, I ended up with a love for politics. The United Labour Front was where Dr. Hosein started out in TNT politics. When I became more heavily involved in the, in the United Labour Front, because I joined the United Labour Front very early, having come back from uh, Jamaica to study in medicine, I joined it in, in, in January 1976. Um, and you'll recall the ULF became the opposition. In 1978, they were there was a split in the ULF in 77. Um, and my leanings were to the, what we would call the Pandey faction. Uh, when I went to work with Karani Limited in St. Madeline, I became more active and pretty shortly became uh, assistant secretary of the, assistant general secretary of the ULF. And uh, so that I was a member of the executive from 78. And I would say that most of the important decisions made by the party, I would have been part and parcel of, uh, including the decision to negotiate with other parties to form the NER. I was on that committee right up to almost the very end. He became Minister of Health in 1986, uh, when the NER got into government at the end of 1986. I don't have to tell you that the Minister of Health is one of the most difficult of all the ministries of government. Ministry of Health is extremely challenging. And um, he was appointed there and he served for two or three years, I think, as Minister of Health. And I think he did his best. I said he was a very conscientious person um, and uh, he was fairly direct in his approach to the solution of problems. Throughout his career, he did what he could, given the circumstances of the period. But I know that he had a somewhat difficult time because of the economic situation. He was trying very hard to get more facilities out in the community, um, health centers and so on, which apparently um, were considered but eventually were um, discarded because of the economic situation at the time. So he was severely constrained. Dr. Hosein went on to serve in the Ministry of Social Development. It's always interesting to note how family members feel about such career and life decisions. His choice going into politics wasn't my choice. <laughs> Politics is never something I really like that much, but I've learned, I've grown to accept it and appreciate it and understand it. All because of his patience and the way he's very good at explaining things. However, there was an impact that Mrs. Hosein could not have predicted. It was very dramatic. It was very scary. It have left a lot of fear in me, still even up to today. 
Dr. Hosein's family was yet another group of people who were stunningly impacted by the events of 1990. It was a time of uncertainty. My kids were very small at the time. You know, my kids were between the ages of 12, 13, 7. You know, I had little, little ones. And at that time, there I was facing with the possibility of losing my husband with four little children. It was very, very dramatic. Thank God we were kept safe during the time by an army personnel family, which I have to say thanks to them a million times because they really took care of us during that time. It's a subject that I try to forget. Clearly a traumatic incident. As much as the family may try to forget, Emmanuel Hossein remembers quite clearly how much of it unfolded. As you know, the events of 1990, and I just read his um, deposition with the Commission of Inquiry, which when I read it, I say, that is Emmanuel Hossein. <laughs> he remembered everything in great detail and described it today, 20 years later or more, in great detail. I was, if I say so myself, one of the people who was able to keep my cool. Uh, I remember having to pull Mrs. Johnson, who was sitting next to me, down because she stood up when the, the guns started to fire you know and i recognized this is gunfire i could see people coming in with guns you know and she started to get up and i had to say come jenny get down you know so i had the presence of mind to go to the ground most mo mo most members of parliament went down i, I think the clip of joe tony going to the ground uh, you know people will recall um the next five days unfolded very interestingly I was the unfortunate witness to the shooting of the Prime Minister and the then Attorney General. Uh, I was literally looking up the gun barrel. Uh, I remember, as it happened, turning to Minister Dukaran and saying, you know, Winston, say you're going to negotiate uh, because the shooting has started. Um, and I had to, to call to him a few times, you know, and I remember him raising his hand and saying, let's talk, let's talk. And that's when the negotiations started. His medical expertise was also called upon for both captives and captors. Well, the leader of the, the, the Muslimin, uh, you know him as Bilal Abdullah, was an old friend of mine in St. Mary's. I knew him at Bradshaw, you know, so, uh, he turned to me and said, you know, some of the fellas, his fellas have been shot, etc. Could I attend to them? So I had to literally, you know, sit there. I remember it was to the side of the speaker's chair and tell all these guys, okay, guys, you know, form a line, you know, <laughs> I'll attend to you one by one, you know. Um, of course, prior to that, I didn't realize that Leo Defiance had been shot. In fact, it's Bilal Abdullah who turned to me and say, um, Emmanuel, you know, Mr. Devines had been shot, could you go over and look at him? So I was one of the first persons who was allowed to move around on the parliament floor. I had to creep across on my hands, I remember, to Leo Devines. And of course, I made certain recommendations, including that he be sent out, that he needed hospital care. The doctor was also called upon to care for Mr. Robinson, Selwyn Richardson, and other members who had been injured. In this time of crisis, even Dr. Hosein's boldness came in handy. I remember that just after Robinson was shot, um, one of the Muslimin tried to gag him, and I recognized immediately that he was going to choke. And I had to shout to the guy, no, you, you, you're choking him, you're choking him, you know? And the guy released the gag. I remember creeping into the, the tea room, which was just off of the, the, the I shouldn't say the tea room. It was a room where they, they, they prepared the tea, which was just off the parliamentary chamber at that time. And going in there, and there's some young Muslimin fellas. I remember most of them had, you know, bandanas across their face. And the, the tap had broken, you see. And I creeped in there, I stood up, and I saw the tea tray and all the tea, and I said, um, Look, you know, members need something to, to drink, you know. I see the tea tray here. Um, why don't you all put on some water to boil and, and um, you know, I'll carry it out um, 
for tea. And when I tried to pick up the tray, I couldn't manage it because of my polio, it was hard for me to um, walk with this heavy tray. And I turned to one of the Muslimin fellas and I said, you, I, could you bring that? You see? And the guy sort of looked at me and I said, boy, maybe this is not a time to, you know, be too aggressive. So I just walked out and I went back into the chamber. And about 15 minutes later, out comes the guy with the tray, with all the teacups and the boiling water. You see, and I said, all right, come put it down here. And I started to make tea, you know, tea and coffee, you know. And I started handing it out to some of the members who were sitting around. And I turned to one or two of the Muslim fellas and said, any of you guys want coffee? You know, and they sort of looked at me and one guy said, okay. After a significant turbulence during his political career, what is he doing today? And would Dr. Hossein consider a return to his passion? Oh yeah, I miss politics. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's the love of my life. Um, I suppose, uh, having been a member and supporter of the COP, um, which now uh, integral part of the, the, the new government, uh, I might yet play a governmental or quasi-governmental role. I, I, hope I'm in a position to contribute and may be called upon at some point in time. You know, the term has just started. Um, so I do hope to, to get back in. Of course, after leaving politics, I had to go back in the government service. I was a district medical officer and uh, in my final few years served as a prison medical officer. Uh, but I'm now retired from the government service, so I'm available for service. Although he considers his accomplishments paling in comparison to individuals who were far less able than he was, Emmanuel Hossein remains a great exemplar for those who face similar challenges. According to Hossein, the disabled have the abilities but society gets in their way. Some would say his character is fitting for the challenges he has faced in both personal and political life and has been critical to his success.